If, like me, you think your problems are overwhelming, then look at what other people have to face. Every successful person has faced difficulties in their life and career. My guests will share with us the challenges they have overcome on the road to success. Every week we'll follow their story right here in Life with me, Patty Boulay. Hello and welcome to Life with me, Patty Boulay. And my guest today, I have the honor of having His Holiness Radna Swami come and have me interview him and just chat with him. I can't tell you I have been preparing for this for such a long time. Now, His Holiness is one of today's most loved and respected spiritual teacher of our time. He has been a monk for 40 years. And his guru, Prabhupada Swami, started the midday meal model in India, which now serves in seven states altogether, 1.2 million meals every single day to children that are impoverished and are at school. This is to encourage them to come to school. This is, it's just incredible. And also, His Holiness obviously lives in Mumbai. And in Mumbai, they have a hospital which has 300 beds. And Your Holiness, may I call you Swamiji? Please. Please. <laughs> Swamiji, please tell me about the hospital to start with because I didn't know about this. I am so honored, so grateful, and so happy to be with you, Patty. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank, Thank you, you for giving me the opportunity to be together. I Our, am really humbled to have you. I can't tell you how incredible this is for me. <laughs> I'm not usually this nervous at interviews. Our hospital began with a few medical students who had a spiritual awakening. And um, as they graduated and took speciality degrees, and more and more nurses and doctors came together. Everyone had their own practices. And then there was an inspiration. Let's start a hospital together. And the idea is for the body, the mind, and the soul, for holistic, complete health. For the body, we integrate allopathy medicine. We do heart surgeries and all the branches of allopathy. And also we have a department for Ayurveda, the traditional yes. Indian medicine, homeopathy, naturopathy, acupuncture, acupressure, yoga, um, health regimes. And we also have, through development of hospitality and how we care for people and counsel people, we try to integrate emotional health care. And we have a spiritual care department because we have Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Jains, Sikhs, Parsis, agnostics, atheists, so many different kinds of people come. And according to their background and their inclination, we try to give them and their families spiritual care, to give people an understanding of deeper and higher hope and meaning in life. I like the spiritual care because that is and everything else, but the spiritual care to me is very important because people forget that we're just spiritual beings going on a physical journey. And I think that's where in the West we fail so badly. Everything is materialistic. Everything is about the body. The mind has been allowed to suffer, so we have mental health problems now. And the spiritual side, oh boy, I mean, churches are gone. Families are completely slashed down to nothing. Grandparents don't have a say. So the spiritual journey is one that is needed. And I wish your hospital could be, could be spread to the UK um, and to the US, really, and become much more, instead of just dealing with the body, when people go to the hospital, obviously when the body's ill, 
it's mostly sometimes it's to do with the spirit being ill. Am I anywhere close to the truth? <laughs> because I don't understand what's going on. Patty, because your heart cares so much, you're always so close to the truth. <laughs> but really, <laughs> why do people want good health? Because they want happiness, they mm. want fulfillment yes. in their life. And oftentimes, mental anxiety causes more suffering than even physical diseases. And if we have a good spiritual foundation in our life, then whatever storms may come, whether it be betrayal or you know, f failure in our businesses or mm -hmm. our, our studies, whether it be diseases or you know, so many other different inevitable problems that come, then we have a foundation that keeps us stable and steady and we have a fulfilling purpose in our life, whatever the seasons of the environment may be. That is, you see, because I tell young people, okay, in the West, they don't like to talk about God. The word God is kind of frowned upon, and yet what we need most is God. I, you know, um, churches are empty. You go to university, the first time I am a visiting teaching fellow at Middlesex University, you know, the first time I was told, well, we don't do politics, we don't do spirituality. We don't do, um, oh, there was a third one, politics, spirituality, and we don't do religion. And I said, well, what am I going to talk to them about? <laughs> if I can't talk to their spirit, what am I? So anyway, but when I got there, I just said to them, I'm sorry, I cannot talk to your outfit. I need to speak to your spirit. I need to address your spirit. If I can't address your spirit, I'm not getting through to you. And I'm surprised that they had me back seven years running. <laughs> you know, um, but the, the young people, once they understand the journey, the spiritual journey, Swamiji, please tell them how to just find their spirit, their, their own spiritual journey. <laughs> please. Everyone has one thing in common. Mm -hmm. Whatever our race, whatever our religion or no religion, whatever our s nationality or even species, yes. ev everyone is seeking pleasure. In Sanskrit, there's a beautiful phrase, ananda mayo bhyashat, that all living beings are pleasure seeking. And what is true pleasure? What is the pleasure we're really looking for? things could give some satisfaction to the body senses and to the mind, but things can never give fulfillment to the heart. Only to love and be loved gives pleasure to the heart. If you give a little girl adequate clothing but inadequate love, she looks lovely but she lives in misery. That is true. If you're starving for water, and some get one gives you jewelry. It can't satisfy you. Yes. I remember when I was with Mother Teresa in Calcutta about 50 years ago, she told me the biggest problem in the world is hunger. Not hunger of the stomach, because you put some food in it and mm -hmm. you could solve that. Hunger of the heart. People are lonely. People do not feel fulfilling relationships. Rich people, poor people, from all different sectors of society. There's this hunger of the heart. And only love can satisfy the hunger of the heart. The origin of that love is the experience of feeling God's love. And the experience of giving love to God. And in the true sense, as it says in the Bible, to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the first and great commandment. And that's the essence of all great spiritual paths. In my own life, Patty, um, I saw so much hatred and prejudice 
in the name of a loving God mm -hmm. that I had to ask. Either I, I need to reject this concept of God or there must be a common essence within all true spiritual paths that's something that beautiful, something that unifies us and something that gives our life true meaning beyond even death. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gabihastini suni chaiva svapaki cha pandita samadarshana The meaning I really found is truly the essence of all true spiritual paths, that wisdom is the capacity to see all living beings with equal vision. Whether one is black or white or red or yellow or brown, or whether one is from the east or the west or male or female, or Jewish or Christian or Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist or Jain or Sikh or atheist or agnostic, whether one is a human or an elephant or a cow or a dog or a cat, wherever there's life, it is sacred. It's sacred. When we understand the sacredness of our own true self, who am I? You know, I'm seeing through my eyes and I'm hearing through my ears and I'm tasting through my tongue and I'm thinking through this brain, but who is the witness? Who is that person that is born and witnesses childhood, adolescence, middle age, old age? The mind is changing, the body is changing, but that spirit, mm. that soul is our true self. And the nature of the soul is its full of happiness. It's such an ananda. And it's undying and it's unborn. And what is the happiness of the soul? It's to love. <clears throat> you cannot love God and not love God's children. Just like this human body we have. We have so many different organs. And each organ has a different shape, a different color, and performs a different function. The kidneys cannot do what the knees do and the brain cannot do what the pancreas does. But every part of the body appreciates and, and recognizes the value of every other part of the body. And they're all serving each other. The purpose of every part of the body is bigger than just themselves. If the stomach is selfish and thinks, I want to keep all this food and that nutrients for myself, the ultimately the body and the stomach itself eventually suffers. <laughs> yes. Sharing mm. is natural for every organ of the body. If, if one prick, pricker goes into a little toe, every part of the body is sending energy, not thinking that that toe is insignificant. And the elevation of human culture is actually compassion. Economic development, political expertise, education, all of these things should be in harmony with the spirit of compassion. And that compassion is when you water the root of the tree, it nat that water naturally goes to every part of the tree. When we awaken that original, natural, dormant love for God that is within us, mm. then that love naturally extends to all living beings in the form of compassion, in the form of respect. And this element of education is so very, very important. So we have a real quality of life. We have a real meaning of life. And that meaning is to be an instrument of love. I know many thoughtful people who don't like the word God because, and I can really sympathize with that because there's so much division and hatred oh, in the name, the of, name God. of God. Yes. But what's important is to understand at the heart of true spirituality God is beautiful. God is the source of all beauty, the source of all love. And to, to recognize that, to, 
to experience that and to be an instrument of magnifying that is what makes life truly beautiful. Your Holiness is... <sighs> okay. When a young person says, how do I know who I... Who am I? How do I know who I am? They struggle because for someone like me, thank God, it was instilled in me from childhood that the very first breath I took was the breath of God. It was his gift to me. And therefore... When I see, everyone I see when I deal with people, that first breath to me is special. So they have the same gift from the same God that gave me this gift of the breath of life that keeps me going until he takes it back. But it's very difficult to explain to a young person to find out when they say, but how do I know who I am? And you say to them, well, it is rooted in God who gave you that first breath. They don't understand it because they just don't have that foundation. And so it's, it's a struggle for them to, to get to that place where they actually believe that that first breath was from God. I think that is where they get confused. Is, is there any way of maybe making it really primary, you know, really simple for them. Mind you, I always think God, the simplest thing is of God. God simplifies everything because we cannot understand the magnitude of his awesomeness. Therefore, everything is simplified. That's my opinion. <laughs> everything is simplified for Patty to understand. Therefore, I look for him in the simple things. So it's, for me, it is easy to say, I have this breath, it is such a great gift. Not only do I have this breath, this body is an incredible piece of engineering. You know, like your, your, your holiness, holiness described it, every part has its own, it's like a working factory, it's incredible. And every bit works together. And I, I say to students, look at your hands. It works. And I say, above all things, if you want to know how special you are, that thumbprint, nobody else has got it in the world. I said, that's what makes me special. I said, nobody can bring me down because I say, you haven't got this. Sorry. This is mine. And my skin is my skin. I don't want somebody else's skin because now everybody wants to be like somebody else. I say, no. This one was specially designed for me, suits me. Your skin might be too loose or too tight. I like mine, thank you very much. But still, it cannot get them to understand who they are, special children of God. And it's because I don't know how to tell them what their journey is. And you do. We are all trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Doing what we can. How do they find that special journey? How do they start going? Because I know you had, um, when you were in Crete, you had a superna well, a supernatural experience that set you on a journey, and you chose to go towards India, which is unusual for you. <laughs> in those days, from your background, from Chicago, and a Jewish background, you were looking for your spiritual journey, which, when I read your book, the first book, The Journey Home, this is Holiness' first book, The Journey Home, you have to get a copy, because this book, some of the journey made me cry, it reminded me of my trip to the UK, in a very, mine was very tiny, but His Holiness' trip, with something else you get this book and then you get the journey within if you really want an answer to the question I've just asked about finding out who you are this will really help you find that answer your holiness you left Crete and set off for India were you ever at one point in your journey thinking, I can't do this? 
I, I just need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> so many times. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. But can I tell the story of how yes, it happened? Yes, please. Yes, please. This was in 1970. I was a teenager in the 1960s, so I had a lot of questions. I was involved in the civil rights movement in America. And of course, the Vietnam War was raging, so there was a lot of question. Why should we be killing people when we don't believe mm -hmm. in why we're there? So I became an activist in many different ways, but I came to a conclusion, unless I change myself, I can't really be an instrument of change in the world. So I believed that that's a spiritual transformation that I required. But then, as I said, you know, which spiritual path? Because it seemed like there were so many disagreements so many and so many contradictions. And I was looking for that essence that was common in all spiritual paths. And I was really finding it. Just like Lord Jesus tells in the Bible, what profiteth the person if they gain the whole world but lose Jesus. their eternal self? That's a universal principle. So I was going to synagogues and I was going to cathedrals and I was going to temples and I was going to forests and museums and ultimately I ended up in a cave in a mountain on the Isle of Crete. And there I would, from there I would climb a mountain and I would, I would pray to God to give me direction. And right at sunset one day I heard a voice. It was an internal voice. It said, go to India. And I had never met an Indian in my life, and I didn't know where India was, and I had no money, and I had no map, but I decided I'm going to go. And I was with a friend in the cave, and we would meet after sunset to discuss our day's experiences. And he said to me, tonight at sunset, something amazing happened. I said, what happened? He said, I heard a voice. I said, what did the voice tell you? He said, you won't believe me. I said, no, I will, tell me. He said, I heard three words. Go to Israel. <laughs> and I said to my friend Gary, he told me to go to India. And we were quite um, silent for some time. <laughs> and then I decided at sunrise tomorrow, I'm leaving for India. So I started hitchhiking. And many difficulties came, hitchhiking through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan to India. Um, I asked. You know, sometimes people were trying to kill me. Sometimes I was getting terrible diseases. Sometimes I was completely disoriented and culture shocked. And, you were being tested. And I didn't have any money, or, and there was no cell phones in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but every time that question came, I just knew that I had a calling in my life. And this was the calling of my heart. And if I neglect this calling of my heart, no matter what else I do in life, it will be superficial, it will be hollow, it won't be truly meaningful. So that I had some confidence in something within myself which I believed was, was God's grace that I must keep moving forward. Gosh, Your Holiness, we're going to take a break there because this is just part one of our interview. And I'm going to come back and interview you next week for part two. And I'd like to finish by saying that if you have a calling, just follow it. Like His Holiness said, you hear that voice inside you, just follow it. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be fraught with problems. Just ask for help. Pray for help. 
ask and you shall receive, says the Lord Jesus. So ask for help. We will be back next week with His Holiness. See you next week. Thank you so much, Your Holiness. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so very much.